The irony wasn't lost on anyone that a man who lived for his music would be found dead at the foot of Beale Street where he'd performed before. 30-year-old Jeff Buckley disappeared last week after a friend saw him jump into the Mississippi fully clothed. Despite several searches by police, it was a tourist on the American Queen ready to set sail on a cruise for St. Louis who finally spotted Buckley's body. 24 years ago today, June 4th, 1997, the body of 30-year-old Jeff Buckley was found along the banks of the Mississippi River. The common misconception here is that it was the Mississippi that took him. To be more accurate, we go up the Mississippi on a 12-minute walk or a 4-minute drive to the area surrounding the Tennessee Welcome Center, where Jeff, and the lone member of his band, waited for the remaining members of the band to arrive from New York City. It was May 29, 1997, a humid 92-degree day in Memphis, Tennessee, and nothing cools you off more than a dip in a body of water. Ever the free spirit, Jeff hopped right into Wolf River Harbor, fully dressed. Button-up shirt, jeans, and combat boots. Howling away at a lazy downriver cover of the course to Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin. It was the last time he would be seen alive. Roadie for the band, Keith Fody, seeing a tugboat coming, went to move the radio as well as the acoustic guitar he had brought along. By the time he came back, Jeff Buckley was gone. And gone he would remain for six days, until on June 4th, a local couple spotted his body along the banks of the Mississippi, at the bottom of Beale Street, now colloquially as America's most iconic street for its place in the history of the blues. But to find out what led Jeff Buckley to be who he was, we have to go back to where he came from. This is Tim Buckley. Long afloat on shipless oceans, I did all my best to smile till you're singing. We meet up in 1964 with Tim Buckley III, a 17-year-old aspiring musician who by all reports was a bit of a vocal powerhouse. High school friend Jim Fielder told writer Martin Aston, we'd sit there and go, oh my god, I've never heard anything as beautiful as this voice. One hesitates to get flowery, but I'd use the words gift from God. He had an incredible range of four octaves, always in tune with a great vibrato he had complete control over. You don't normally hear that stuff from a 17-year-old. But it wasn't only his friends that Tim Buckley had the power to impress. It was in Anaheim's Loria High French class that Tim's eye was caught by the musically trained musician 16-year-old Mary Guibert. Ever the romantic lyricist, Tim would slip her notes, expressing admiration through poetry. At first, Mary was put a bit off by his advances and found him a bit too much. But eventually, she saw something she liked in him, and the two began dating. Tim Buckley now had two beautiful things in his life, his music and his girl. And over the next year and some change, the relationship with both would grow stronger. While moonlighting as a folk band, the Bohemians and or the Harlequin Three, depending on the night, with close friends Jim Fielder, Larry Beckett, and Brian Hartzell, Tim worked at Taco Bell, while Mary worked in Disneyland at the Casa de Fritos Eatery. Incidentally, this would be the place where Doritos would be birthed, and around the same time she worked there as well. During this period of time, Tim enrolled in college. No one has it narrowed down, but it's either Fullerton or Ventura. 
a decision that was very short-lived, as he dropped out after about two weeks. Also at this period of time, 17-year-old Mary told Tim that she was pregnant, and the two scrambled to have a shotgun wedding. Tim wanted to do right by her. The two were wed on October 25, 1965, in the Gobert Family Church in Anaheim, St. Michael's Episcopal. It was a sparse crowd that showed up to the wedding, consisting of only about 20-odd people. Notably absent was Mary's father. It is alleged that Tim told best man Larry Beckett that he didn't want to go through with the wedding. Of course he loved Mary at some point, but as you will come to see, Tim Buckley was a very self-involved man. He felt the noose of suburbia creeping around his neck, and it wasn't something that sat well with him. In a sort of bit of poetry for what was to come, the newlywed couple spent their first married night sleeping on the floor of a Laguna Beach hotel, as their vibrating bed would not stop vibrating. Soon, the couple rented an apartment not far from Mary's childhood home, which must have hurt considering she was now shunned by those she once called family. She dropped out of high school and began taking typing classes. All the while, Tim and his bohemians were playing a pretty regular set of gigs, playing the troubadour and some local musical festivals as well. Buckley and Beckett also scraped together the money to record some songs on tape, getting a studio time for $6 an hour. Inflation clocks that in at about $50 an hour as of 2021. But while things were looking up for Buckley and the Bohemians, domestically things weren't so hot for Mr. and Mrs. Buckley. A lot of finger pointing went on as to who was to blame for the blissless marriage, but I think it all boils down to the fact that they were essentially still children. Regardless of the finger pointing, if a date was needed to mark the beginning of their end, it would be January 1966. On New Year's Eve, Mary was rushed to the hospital after waking up to find her sheets soaked in blood. Three days later, she felt her water break and returned to the hospital, only to learn that she hadn't in fact been pregnant at all. She was suffering a so-called hysterical or phantom pregnancy. It seemed that every step Tim's career took forward, his relationship with Mary would take a step back, with the two taking time apart in 1966, and Tim moving to New York to work on his music. For what it's worth, it is very much noted that Mary was Tim's equal, and it seemed that that scared him. For the majority of 1966, Tim traveled and screwed around on Mary, even brazenly celebrating the new woman in his life and his infidelities with her in his song, Song for Janie. Yes, I truly love to be with you If I wasn't with the one that I'm with Yes, I truly love to lie by you If I didn't have to give what I give It would be August of 1966 that the death knell in their relationship would show itself. Mary was pregnant and this time it was much more than a phantom pregnancy, leading Tim to ask Mary to get an abortion and Mary telling him to stay. Not to be held back by an ultimatum for a woman he no longer loved, Tim left Mary, and would maintain for the rest of his life that it wasn't Jeff he left behind, but Mary. The two divorced in October 1966, and that was that. Perhaps the biggest testament to how Tim thought of Mary and his child would come in his 1967 ode to them both, I Never Asked to Be Your Mountain. Flying Pisces sails for time and tells me of my child. Wrapped in bitter tales and heartache, he begs for just a smile. Mary went into labor on the morning of Thursday, November 17, 1966, and was driven by her mother to Anaheim's Martin Luther Hospital. Tim Buckley was nowhere to be found. It was 10.49 on Thursday, November 17, 1966, that Jeffrey Scott Buckley was brought into the world. His childhood was lived as Scotty Moorhead. 
the son of Mary Hubert and stepfather Ronald Moorhead. Growing up in and around Orange County, California, living a life he would later describe as, quote, rootless trailer trash, despite never actually living in a trailer, he would also claim that he never fit in anywhere as a child, telling the Guardian newspaper in 1994 how his mother was the one pushing for the family to move around, saying, We'd spend a few months in some places, longer in others, but we never hung around for long. The best places were also the worst, because just as I'd make friends with someone, we'd be out of there. I got pretty good at working out who wanted to punch me, and who would defend me. I'm an excellent judge of character now. I guess my mother just always wanted to know what was around the next corner. Growing up, Scotty would sing harmonies with his mother, even noodling around on an acoustic guitar he found in his grandmother's closet when he was five years old. Scotty was fed a healthy diet of classical music, as well as hard rock staples such as Kiss, Pink Floyd, and Led Zeppelin. No stairway. Denied. As well as a smattering of female crooners like Nina Simone, Judy Garland, and Billie Holiday. His stepfather Ron actually gave him his first album, Physical Graffiti the sixth studio album from Led Zeppelin. Buckley would tell an interviewer in 1994, reflecting on Led Zeppelin, that was the first voice I really fell in love with. Young Robert Plant back when he sounded like jeans. He was trying to sound like some howling wolf, but he didn't. He sounded like some big effing animal, he would say. It's believed that Scotty grew up with very limited knowledge of his paternal father and didn't even know his own first name was Jeff until he discovered it written on his birth certificate. When he was eight years old, he would spend a week with his father, but it was an odd experience for both of them, Jeff recalling that he never even got a chance to speak with him as he locked himself in his room. Tim Buckley would die one year later on June 28, 1975, from a heroin overdose at the age of 28. Scotty would not be invited to the funeral. From the age of 12 on, Scotty would dive headfirst into music, and at age 13, he received his first electric guitar, a black imitation Les Paul, a moment that would change his life forever. As fate would have it, he attended Loara High and played in the school's jazz band. During this time, he developed an affinity for progressive rock bands such as Rush, Genesis, Yes. As well as jazz fusion guitarist L.D. Miola. As these things happen, much like Barry Gibbs not knowing he could sing a high falsetto until he was 30, Buckley supplied only backing vocals to the various bands he found himself in, having little idea at the time of the full four-octave tenor vocal powerhouse living inside of him. He also played guitar in a wide array of bands, everything from heavy metal bands to jazz combos, even accompanying reggae artist Shinehead as a touring guitarist. After graduating from high school, he moved north to Hollywood to attend the Musicians Institute completing the one-year course at the age of 19. He later told Rolling Stone the school was, quote, the biggest waste of time, but noted in an interview with Double Take magazine that he appreciated studying music theory there, saying, I was attracted to really interesting harmonies, stuff I would hear in Ravel, Ellington, Bartok. It was at this time he began going by Jeff Buckley to honor his deceased father. Much like the wandering spirit that lived in his father, Jeff moved to New York City in February 1990, but found few opportunities to work as a musician. He was introduced to Kowali, the devotational music of India and Pakistan, and Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan, one of its best known singers. He became interested in blues musician Robert Johnson and hardcore punk band Bad Brains during this time. He moved back to Los Angeles in September when his father's former manager, Herb Cohen, 
offered to help him record his first demo of original songs. Buckley completed Babylon Dungeon Sessions, a four-song cassette that included the songs Eternal Life, Unforgiven, later titled Last Goodbye, Strawberry Street, a different version of which appears on Grace Legacy Edition, and Punk Screamer Radio. Cohen and Buckley hoped to attract attention from the music industry with a demo tape. Nothing much came from the tape other than the experience, and in 1990, Jeff moved back to New York City to pursue a solo career. The New York period, this time around, was considerably more fruitful. He was inspired by the likes of Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan and Robert Johnson, and his big coming out was a show-stealing performance at a tribute concert for his father called Greetings from Tim Buckley at St. Anne's Church in Brooklyn during the spring of 1991. The event would be one of the few times Buckley performed any of his father's songs. In fact, most of Jeff Buckley's career was spent distancing himself from his father's image rather than celebrating it. To the point at one concert, someone asked him to play a song by Tim, and he responded by saying, I don't play that hippie shit. With accompaniment by experimental rock guitarist Gary Lucas, Buckley performed the aforementioned I Never Asked to Be Your Mountain. Buckley returned to the stage to play Sophronia, The King's Chain, Phantasmagoria in two, and concluded the concert with Once I Was, performed acoustically with an impromptu a cappella ending due to a snapped guitar string. Music journalist David Brown would say, Suddenly before the last chorus, a string broke on his acoustic guitar, and Jeff sang the lines, Sometimes I wonder for a while, do you ever remember me? Unaccompanied. If that weren't dramatic enough, his voice spiraled up on the last word, me, like a thin plume of smoke, holding on for a moment before drifting up to the ceiling. He took a quick bow and said thanks, and trotted off stage, and the concert ended. It would not have been a more perfect finale if he had planned it. Backstage, he cried and accepted congratulations and compliments, as well as a few business cards passed to him. He couldn't believe he'd been allowed to sing so many songs, and was overwhelmed. Obituaries for Tim Buckley failed to mention him having a son, and those closest to him were shocked to learn he had a child. Wilner, the show's organizer, later recalled that Buckley's set closer made a strong impression. His performance at the concert was counterintuitive to his desire to distance himself musically from his father. Buckley later explained his reasoning to Rolling Stone. It wasn't my work, it wasn't my life, but it bothered me that I hadn't been to his funeral, that I'd never been able to tell him anything. I used that show to pay my last respects. The concert proved to be his first step into the music industry that had eluded him for years. Following that performance, Jeff wasn't sure about his newfound path to stardom, telling the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1994, In a way, I sacrificed my anonymity for my father, whereas he sacrificed me for his fame. So I guess I made a mistake. The next few months after their performance, Buckley spent performing solo shows at coffee houses and small clubs around the city, but it was a small Irish cafe called Chenet that would become his home. He quickly scored the weekly Monday night slot, playing Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan covers and a few originals like Mojo Pin and Grace, the latter which he'd written with Gary Lucas for a short-lived stint in Lucas's band, Gods and Monsters. Armed with just an electric guitar and a microphone stand, the Chenet gig showcased Buckley in the raw, and word spread. Every week, more people began showing up to see him perform, and when the line began snaking around the block to get in, Record label executives soon followed. Sony would put out a four-song EP called Live from Chenet in 1993, which featured an inspired rendition of Van Morrison's The Way Young Lovers Do. Buckley eventually signed to Columbia Records and immediately set to work on his debut album, Grace. The romantic reason, the emotional reason why I went with Sony, well, Columbia, 
it always means Columbia to me. When you walk in, the first thing you see is Bob Dylan. On the wall, looking beautiful, as always. A foot away is Miles. A foot away is Monk. A foot away is Johnny Mathis. A foot away is Duke Ellington. Chambers Brothers. Fishbone's there. Mahalia. Even though it's a com that's, that company doesn't exist anymore. But there's no escaping the roots of that company. Grace is what matters in anything, um, especially life, especially growth, tragedy, pain, love, death. That's a quality I, I admire very greatly. It keeps you from reaching for the gun too quickly. It keeps you from destroying things too foolishly. It sort of keeps you alive. Sessions for Grace began in September of 1993, a month before his EP came out, and while the label had a lot riding on his first studio recording, many of the suits at Columbia started to worry as Buckley hadn't yet assembled a band weeks prior to hitting the studio. Buckley would tell Juice in 1996, Rather than have anybody pick my band, I decided to stall until I found the right people. So I stalled, and I lied. Nothing was really happening because I hadn't found anybody, he'd reveal. Eventually, Buckley found his band, composed of bassist Mick Grondel and drummer Matt Johnson. But he hadn't yet revealed to them that he had signed a deal with Columbia Records. When his band had finally assembled to rehearse, he revealed he had a record deal and recording would start in a few weeks. Producer Andy Wallace remembered the anxiety that set in, revealing what the first rehearsals were like, saying, They would start a riff that would turn into a jam, eventually abandoning the riff, and it would just go on for ten minutes. It was interesting, but my first impression was, wait a minute, I thought you guys were learning songs. We've got studio time booked. In September, the trio headed to Bearsville Studios in Woodstock, New York, to spend six weeks recording basic tracks for what would become Grace. Buckley invited ex-bandmate Lucas to play guitar on the songs Grace and Mojo Pin, and Woodstock-based jazz musician Carl Berger wrote and conducted string arrangements with Buckley assisting at times. Buckley returned home for overdubbing at studios in Manhattan and New Jersey, where he performed take after take to capture the perfect vocals and experimented with ideas for additional instruments and added textures to the songs. At one point, sessions for the album came to a grinding halt after one reviewer, who was writing about his four-song EP, compared Buckley to Michael Bolton, who was an artist he detested at the time. The comparison was so shocking, Buckley took several days off from recording, telling an interviewer for Interview Magazine, that's really disgusting. The thing is, I'm not taking from that tradition. The tradition in question was stealing from black musicians, with Jeff being quoted as saying, I don't want to be black. Michael Bolton desperately wants to be black, black, black. He also sucks. This is, of course, in reference to Bolton pilfering from various black artists throughout his career, most notably the Isley Brothers, with his uncredited taking of their song, Love is a Wonderful Thing. a case that was settled in the early 2000s and netted the Isley Brothers about $5.5 million in royalties. When it came time to closing the track list for Grace, Buckley didn't feel he had enough strong original compositions for the record. The album would feature three covers, which dated back to his club days in New York. A cover of Nina Simone's Lilac Wine, was hypnotized by strange delight under a lilac tree. The Benjamin Britten hymn, Corpus Christi Carol.
Perhaps the most famous cover was his version of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Throughout the recording process, Buckley seemed to clash with the record executives. One song that was slated for the album was titled Forget Her. The vitrolic and personal song about Buckley's messy breakup with then-girlfriend Rebecca Moore. The label execs heard a huge hit, but at the last minute, Buckley pulled the song. The suits at Columbia Records were so desperate for the song, they took Buckley out to an Italian restaurant to plead their case, but it fell on deaf ears. On top of that, folks at Columbia Records were dumbfounded by Buckley's choice for the cover of the album. They thought it made him look like an 80s pop star. Not helping was the flashy jacket he was wearing, which he bought from a thrift store. Once again, label executives pushed him with alternate cover designs, but again, it fell on deaf ears. Sales of Grace were slow, and it garnered little radio airplay despite critical acclaim. The Sydney Morning Herald proclaimed it a romantic masterpiece, and a pivotal defining work. Despite slow initial sales of the album, the album went gold in France and Australia over the next two years, achieving gold status in the U.S. in 2002, and selling over six times platinum in Australia in 2006. Grace won appreciation from a host of revered musicians and artists, including members of Buckley's biggest influence, Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page considered Grace close to being his favorite album of the decade. Robert Plant was also complimentary, as was Brad Pitt saying of Buckley's work, there's an undercurrent to his music. There's something you can't pinpoint, like the best of films or the best of art. There's something going on underneath, and there's a truth there. And I find his stuff absolutely haunting. It just, it's under my skin. And you hear that, that opening tune of Mojo Pin, it's that real soft thing. Mm -hmm. That haunting thing off in the distance, and and I remember asking, her, what, "What is that?" And she says, uh, "That's that's Jeff Buckley." And where have I been? What, do I know nothing? <laughs> and uh, since then, it's just uh, been a bit of an obsession, I guess. Others who had influenced Buckley's music lauded him. Bob Dylan naming Buckley one of the greatest songwriters of this decade. In an interview with The Village Voice, David Bowie named Grace as the one album he would take with him to a desert island. Even Bono from U2 said, Jeff Buckley was a pure drop in an ocean of noise. Some of the very first shows were attended by musicians like Chris Cornell from Soundgarden and Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders. The album eventually went on to feature in Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time, coming in at number 147. The album took almost eight months to make its mark, when in May of 1995, the single Last Goodbye got a lot of attention being put into rotation on both MTV and VH1. Also in May of 95, Jeff was named one of People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People. He was mortified. Something snapped. He dyed his hair black and stopped washing it. He wallowed thin in giant thrift store plaid shirts and Doc Martens a friend would say. Buckley spent much of the next year and a half touring internationally to promote Grace. From the album's release, he played in numerous countries, from Australia to the UK, at the Glastonbury Festival, and at the 1995 Meltdown Festival, at which he sang Henry Purcell's Dido's Lament at the invitation of Elvis Costello. Following Buckley's Peyote Radio Theater Tour, the band began a European tour on August 23, 1994. 
starting with performances in the UK and Ireland. The tour continued in Scandinavia, and throughout September, numerous concerts in Germany were played. The tour ended on September 22nd with a concert in Paris. A gig in September 24th in New York dovetailed on to the end of the European tour, and Buckley and the band spent the next month relaxing and rehearsing. A tour of Canada and the U.S. began on October 19th, 1994 at CBGB. The tour was far-reaching with concerts held on both east and west coast of the U.S. and a number of performances in central and southern states. The tour ended two months later on December 18th at Maxwell's in Hoboken, New Jersey. After another month of rest and rehearsal, the band commenced a second European tour, this time mainly for promotion purposes. The band began the tour in Dublin, and Buckley has remained particularly popular in Ireland. The short tour largely consisted of promotional work in London and Paris. In late January, the band did their first tour of Japan, playing concerts and appearing for a promotion of the album and newly released Japanese single, Last Goodbye. The band returned to Europe on February 6th and toured various Western European countries before returning to the U.S. on March 6th. Among the gigs performed during this period, Buckley and his band performed at a 19th century built French venue, the Bataclan. A material from the concert was recorded and later released in October of that year as a four track EP, Live from the Bataclan. Songs from a performance on February 25th at the venue Nighttown in Rotterdam were subsequently released as a promotional only CD, So Real. Touring commenced in April with dates across the US and Canada. And during this period, Buckley and the band notably played the Metro in Chicago, which was recorded on video and later released as live in Chicago on VHS and later on DVD. In addition, on June 4th, they played at Sony Music Studios for the Sony Music Radio Hour. Following this was a month-long European tour between June 20th and July 18th, in which they played many summer music festivals. During the tour, Buckley played two concerts at Paris Olympia, a venue made famous by the French vocalist Edith Piaf. Although he had failed to fill out smaller American venues at this point of his career, both nights at the large Paris Olympia venue were sold out. Shortly after this, Buckley attended the Festival de la Musique Sacrée, Festival of Sacred Music, also held in France, and performed What Will You Say as a duet with Alim Kwasimov, an Azerbaijani Mukham singer. Sony BMG has since released a live album, 2001's Live à l'Olympia, which has a selection of songs from both Olympia performances and the collaboration with Quasimov. Buckley's Mystery Whiteboard Tour, playing concerts in both Sydney and Melbourne, Australia, lasted between August 28th and September 6th, and recordings of these performances were compiled and released on the live album Mystery White Boy. Buckley was so well received during these concerts that his album Grace went gold in Australia, selling over 35,000 copies. And taking this into account, he decided a longer tour was needed and returned for a tour of New Zealand and Australia in February the following year. Between the two tours, Buckley and the band took a break from touring. Buckley played solo in the meantime with concerts at Chennai and New Year's Eve concert at the Mercury Lounge in New York. After a break, the band spent the majority of February on the Hard Luck Tour in Australia and New Zealand, but tensions had risen between the group and drummer Matt Johnson. The concert on March 1st, 1996 was the last gig he played with Buckley and his band. Following Johnson's departure, the band, now without a drummer, was put on hold and did not perform live again until February 12th, 1997. Due to the pressure from extensive touring, Buckley spent the majority of the year away from the stage. However, from May 2nd to the 5th, he played a short stint as bass guitarist with Mind Science of the Mind with friend Nathan Larson, then a guitarist of Shudder to Think. Buckley returned to playing live concerts when he went on the Phantom Solo Tour of cafes in the Northeast in December 1996, appearing under a series of aliases. The Crack Robots, Possessed by Elves, Father Demo, Smack Robiotic, The Half Speeds, Crit Club, Topless America, Martha and the Nicotines, and a puppet show named Julio. 
By way of justification, Buckley posted a note on his website stating that he missed the anonymity of playing in cafes and local bars, with the message on his website saying, There was a time in my life not too long ago when I could show up in a cafe and simply do what I want, make music, learn from performing my music, explore what it means to me, i.e. have fun while I irritate and or entertain an audience who don't know me or what I am about. In this situation, I have that precious and irreplaceable luxury of failure, of risk, of surrender. I worked very hard to get this kind of thing together, this work for him. I loved it, and then I missed it when it disappeared. All I am doing is reclaiming it. After completing touring in 1996, Buckley started writing a new album, to be called Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk. He worked with Patti Smith on her 1996 album Gone Again, and met collaborator Tom Verlaine, the lead singer for the punk band Television. Buckley asked Verlaine to be producer on the new album, and he agreed. In mid-1996, Buckley and his band began recording sessions in Manhattan with Verlaine. Eric Idle played the drums to these sessions as a stopgap between the dates Matt Johnson left before Parker Kindred joined as full-time drummer. Around this time, Buckley met Inger Laurie of the Nymphs in an East Village bar, and struck up a fast and close friendship. Together, they contributed a track to Kerouac Kicks Joy, Darkness, a Jack Kerouac tribute album. After Laurie's backup guitarist for an upcoming album quit the project, Buckley offered to fill in. He became attached to one of the songs from the album, Yard of Blonde Girls, and covered it on sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk. Another recording session in Manhattan followed in early 1997, but Buckley and the band were unsatisfied. On February 4th, 1997, Buckley played a short set at the Ning Factory's 10th anniversary concert featuring a selection of his new songs, Jewel Box, Morning Theft, Everybody Here Wants You, The Sky is a Landfill, and Yard of Blonde Girls. Lou Reed was there to watch and expressed an interest in working with Buckley. The band played their first gig with Parker Kindred, their new drummer, at Arlene's Grocery in New York on February 9th. The set featured much of Buckley's new material that would appear on sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk, and a recording has become one of Buckley's most widely distributed bootlegs. Later that month, Buckley recorded a spoken word reading of Edgar Allan Poe's poem, Ula Loom. And we passed to the end of the vista, but we're stopped by the door of a tomb by the door of a legended tomb. And I said, what is written, sweet sister, on the door of this legended tomb? She replied, Ulalum, Ulalum, tis the vault of thy lost Ulalum. For the album closed on account of rabies. It was his last recording in New York. Shortly after, he moved to Memphis, Tennessee. Buckley became interested in recording at Easley McCain Recording in Memphis at the suggestion of friend Dave Schaus from the Grifters. He rented a shotgun house there for $450 a month, about $750 as of 2021, of which he was so fond he contacted the owner about the possibility of buying it. He owned little more than a couch, a telephone, and a phone book. The time he did not spend cycling back and forth from a Vietnamese restaurant, he spent lying on the grass in his backyard, or at the butterfly exhibit at the Memphis Zoo. Throughout this period, February 12th to May 26th, 1997, Buckley played at Barrister's, a bar located in downtown Memphis, underneath a parking garage in an alley off Jefferson Avenue. He played numerous times in order to work through the new material in a live atmosphere. At first with the band, then solo as part of a Monday night residency. In early February, Buckley and the band did a third recording session with Verlaine in Memphis, but Buckley expressed his dissatisfaction with the sessions and later called Grace producer Andy Wallace to step in as Verlaine's replacement. Buckley started recording demos on his own four-track recorder in preparation for a forthcoming session with Wallace. Some of these demos were sent to his band in New York, who listened to them enthusiastically and were excited to resume working on the album. These recordings would go on to compose the second disc of Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk. However, Buckley was not entirely happy with the results, and he sent his band back to New York while he stayed behind to work on the songs. The band was scheduled to return to Memphis for rehearsals 
and recording sessions on May 29, 1997. Stay with me under these waves tonight. Be free. In your life tonight. It was 8.30 p.m. on Thursday, May 29, 1997. Jeff Buckley and Keith Fody were on what should have been a 10-minute drive from Jeff's shotgun house to the studio space they had rented for sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk. Jeff had given up hope on finding the place, especially when the person with solid directions to the place, Gene Bowen, his tour manager, was on a plane from New York to Memphis, so he asked Keith, do you want to get some ribs? But Keith wasn't feeling it. When ribs became a non-option, Jeff asked Keith a question that would change their lives forever. It's a nice night. Why don't we go down to the river for a while? The Wolf River is a tributary of the Mississippi River. With its slowly rippling water, the wolf resembles a lake more than a river. But with its intersection to the Mississippi, the undercurrents can be deceptive. Ask anyone in Memphis and they can tell you Jeff wasn't the first and wouldn't be the last to be taken by the wolf. There's whirlpools throughout. It would suck you down. It would hold you. It would move you along the bottom. Uh, you'd be torn through debris and so forth, battered and bruised. And then all of a sudden it just push you to the top. You had, there was no, no ability to swim. There's nothing you could do for yourself. You just had to go with it. Um, it's like a monster's got a hold of you, and there's just nothing you can do, nothing at all. Fody, originally a hairdresser in New York, was known for dabbling in some songwriting of his own and had brought along his acoustic guitar and boombox that night. A few yards downriver from a bridge that connects to a peninsula known as Mud Island, was a spot where Buckley told Fody he had swum before. The shoreline was littered with sharp rocks and broken bottles. As Fody stayed at the water's edge, Buckley waded in. He didn't bother to remove his white button-up shirt, jeans, or black combat boots. Fody asked, What are you doing, man? But Jeff didn't pay attention. As he eased into the water, he started doing a backstroke. He said something to his friend about the first one being fun, but the second one. Fody didn't know what he meant. Then Jeff began to sing Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin, joking about how the echo in the harbor made his voice sound like Robert Plant's. He kept swimming further out. It was about 9.15 p.m. Jeff had been in the water for nearly 15 minutes. He started swimming, goal driven toward the mud island side of the wolf. That's when Fody saw the tugboat. Jeff, there's a boat coming. Get out of the water, he called. Jeff swam out of its path, but a bigger boat followed. The water was getting choppy, lapping at the shoreline, and Fody reached down to move his boombox and guitar, and when he looked back up a second later, he'd lost sight of Jeff. He screamed for help for ten minutes before a marina worker nearby heard him and called 911. It was also around this time that the rest of his band landed in Memphis. It wasn't long until they were given the news that Jeff was missing. It took about 30 minutes before a proper search party was assembled. Patrol boats, scuba divers, and helicopters fitted with searchlights and heat imaging equipment. Three hours later, with a thunderstorm only hindering the process, there was still no sign of Jeff Buckley. At 1 a.m., the search was called off. Jeff's friends and family were not sure this was anything more than Jeff being Jeff. He was known for disappearing from time to time, when the world got a bit too much to handle. Even celebrities were distraught at his disappearance, including Skid Row frontman Sebastian Bach. And my wife drove in and I go, move over. She goes, what's wrong? I go, Jeff Buckley like went swimming and they can't find him and they, you know, don't know where he's at. And um, I just got in the car, you know, with my five-year-old son and drove all the way up to Shanae and just sat there all night, you know, and he fell asleep in my chest and, and we just sang songs and because I didn't know what to do with that that grief. I didn't know what to do. However, six days later, those hopes for being pranked would be extinguished. On June 4th, a passenger aboard the American Queen Riverboat saw something caught in a tangle of branches floating in the Mississippi. It was the body of Jeff Buckley. 
Though his face and hands had been damaged by the water, positive identification was made by a gold ring through his belly button. Two weeks later, the medical examiner at the University of Tennessee in Memphis declared that Buckley had tested negative for drugs and that his blood alcohol level was 0.04 milligrams, the equivalent of a glass of wine. The official cause of death was accidental drowning with no evidence of other injuries. The Memphis police closed the case. To some, his death didn't seem like a surprise. As Buckley's girlfriend, Joan Wasser, remembered, not too long after we met, he said, you know, I'm going to die young. While Buckley's friend, Tammy Shouse, would tell Mojo Magazine, I feel like Memphis walked him down the aisle, because he was dreaming about his death, and he knew that something was up, and he felt it. There's something odd about the fact that Jeff died about 25 minutes from Graceland, and his body was found down the street from Grace Church. Jeff was known to have been very proud of having made it to 30, surpassing the age of 28, unlike his father, even being quoted in terms of his drug abuse as saying, Drugs are like Las Vegas. The house always wins. Speaking to NPR, Buckley's former manager, Dave Laurie, opened up about the musician's final weeks, claiming he was acting erratic, revealing he was trying to buy a house that wasn't for sale, he was trying to buy a car that wasn't for sale. He proposed to Joan. He even applied for a job to be a butterfly keeper at the Memphis Zoo. A lot of weird stuff that was uncharacteristic for him. I think it was a yearning to settle down. He wanted a normal life. Immediately following Buckley's death, his label, Columbia Records, called a hastily organized meeting, not to mourn the singer, but to talk about posthumous releases, which angered his manager with him even thinking, I had absolutely no faith in Sony to do the right thing by Jeff. I was furious that this meeting about posthumous releases had been called so soon. I'd had a ton of calls from distressed Sony employees who also thought it was insensitive. I went around as many desks as I could to support those who were in bits over Jeff's death. In the years that followed his death, Buckley's mother worked with Sony to put out unreleased tracks, including 1998's double disc set, Sketches from My Sweetheart the Drunk, and several others in the subsequent year. During a 2002 interview with The Guardian, his mother spoke about managing her son's legacy, saying, I have to compartmentalize myself quite a bit. There's the musician side of me, and the businesswoman side, and the mother side of me, which never turns off. But the emotions are things I kind of have to set aside. That's why I take good counsel. I've always involved people from Jeff's band. It makes it a lot easier, especially if there are any critical blows. But the work we've done so far has been well-received. And well-received it was. As since his passing, Jeff has been the part of many tributes. Duncan Sheik's A Body Goes Down paid tribute to Buckley on Sheik's 1998 album Coming, which was also included in the documentary Amazing Grace, Jeff Buckley. Drummer Matt Johnson played drums on the track. Glenn Hansard wrote Neath the Beaches in memory of Buckley. It appears on the album Dance the Devil by Hansard's band, The Frames. And I lie with you beneath the beaches on the strand of Chris Cornell's song Wave Goodbye from his album Euphoria Morning pays tribute to Buckley. Nobody ever lives forever. Pete Yorn's song, Bandstand in the Sky, from his album Nightcrawler and his live album Live from New Jersey, is a tribute to Buckley. Zeta Swoon's song, Song for a Dead Singer, from the album I Paint Pictures on a Wedding Dress, is a tribute to Jeff Buckley. Coldplay's song Shiver was inspired by Jeff Buckley's Grace, 
Chris Martin even calling it a ripoff of Jeff Buckley. Did you want me to change? Well, I changed for good. And I want you to know that you'll always get your way. Rufus Wainwright, who also covered Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen, has the song Memphis Skyline on his 2004 album Want To about the death of Jeff Buckley. Then came hallelujah, like metal for me in my room Lisa Germano's Except for the Ghost from the album In the Maybe World was written for Buckley. Alone in the sea, alone in the sea, the deeper you go, the letting it be. Amy Mann's Just Like Anyone from the album Bachelor Number 2 plays tribute to Buckley. So maybe it's true that your cry for help was also very faint. In 2020, I started a very short-lived podcast called Heard It in a Love Song, which was meant to be a look into a classic love song each week. I had planned on a May 2020 release of a special episode on Jeff Buckley, but as you know, 2020 kind of fell apart. One of my favorite love songs of all time is Lover You Should Have Come Over. It is a beautifully dark and tortured song by a beautifully dark and tortured man. The lyrics are relatable because at their core, they are lyrics that express the shared experience of heartbreak due to something you did and the hope that maybe you can win someone back. At a concert in Italy, Buckley introduced this song by saying, I wrote this song while lying listening for the telephone in my apartment but she never called. The she in question was ex-girlfriend at the time, artist, musician, activist, and actress Rebecca Moore. Currently runs a farm for injured animals in upstate New York, the Institute for Animal Happiness. Lover You Should Have Come Over is written in the key of D major and clocks in at 120 beats per minute. And that's it, the end of episode one of Heard It in a Love Song. I plan on ending every episode a few different ways, depending on the subject at hand. First, for those episodes wherein the artist is deceased, I will be picking who I would choose to play them in a biopic. My choice for the actor in a biopic for Jeff Buckley, despite the fact that there is one planned with actor Reeve Carney, would sadly be another artist taken way too soon, Heath Ledger, who oddly died at the same age as Tim Buckley, 28. And secondly, I'll be giving you some music homework. Check out the song My Lover by the husband and wife duo Bird Talker. You're my lover. You're my lover. If you like what you see here and you are excited for what's to come, everything from You Out of Bad to Hey There Delilah, please consider subscribing. I plan on releasing a video every Friday. Until next time, my name is Richard Hunt, and you heard it in a love song. How do you want to be remembered? As a good friend. I don't, I don't really need to be remembered. I hope the music's remembered. The music's remembered.